So <clears throat> that was um, a video by a very famous um, influential urban urban designer, um, and um, I guess you can see many links to you know what we have discussed um, so far, and um, I guess potentially thinking about. I don't want to say too much, perhaps at this stage, um, but perhaps think about you know the the link between the design morphology, the mo elements of morphology, and the question of urbanization. Um, and he very much starts his conversation with urbanization, um, a picture of urbanization. So. Um, so very much doing the reverse of what we did. We started in the lecture, we started with the neighborhood, then zoomed out, and he kind of zoomed back in. So we're basically where we started <laughs> in terms of scale. So what 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 are your do you agree? What's your opinion? What what are your thoughts? Well, um group two have prepared some some answers to the okay. uh, that we were given. Um, uh, but I guess the first question is is the same as um, yours. Uh, it's um, why is building better cities important? Do you think compact mixed urban form will solve most of the problems in relation to climate change? Why so and why not? Um, so we um, in group two we think that uh, Calthorpe's vision is. Um, it's um, uh, when he presents it, it's it's uh, quite a utopian. Um, but I'm not sure that he he argues that it will solve uh, all of the problems uh, in relation to climate change. Uh, he he advocates for for um, efficiency in the planning, uh, which will um, will re reduce our dependency on on cars. Um, but um, yeah, so so uh, we we think that he's right in in theory, but we don't think that we that it will solve all of the problems. Uh, for instance, um, if you think of um, um, uh, pandemics in the future, um, densities. My de de density might might not be the like the the optimal planning form. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, and thanks for reminding me of the questions that you know, we we posted beforehand. Um, and um, so I think you are um, definitely um, making a point point here, which I think is we're run, was running through the discussion this morning um, as well, the degree to which urban form and cities can be part of the solution, right? And there are very much often, or very often presented as part of the solution. Um, and I've just quickly looked at the other videos um, that, you, that you've seen on the, on the blog website. Um, and you find similar narratives in some of the videos where cities are very much, again, these agents of change. Here with Kalta, much more careful. That's absolutely, um, absolutely right. Um, and um, emphasizing some of the um, you know, um, constraints um, cities might be limited by. And um, one link um, was also um, about um, choices and lifestyle and behavior. Did you have any thoughts on that, on um, the behavior angle? Any, anything you notice? Uh, anyone else, of course, anyone, everyone is invited. <laughs> I was wondering uh, on, on the issue of behavior that actually uh, this video um, seemed to me somewhat similar to the, the first video we watched in class to Robert Mugler's. Right. Uh, TED talk um, where he's also formulating some some rather universal principles and with this also some I think rather universal ideas of how how people would like to have their environments mm 
And um, what he and as well Robert Muga didn't talk about were, I think, rather participatory approaches to urban planning. And I think in this regard, it's uh, particularly funny that he he has this big example of China, which is not known for uh, well, participatory uh, city planning, I think. And in, in the same way, Robert Muga had the example of Singapore. And um, so these as two very ideal situations where you can uh, redevelop urban spaces towards sustainability. And uh, in this sense, maybe a number of uh, personal um, or small cultural ideas and attitudes towards their, their lives and needs in urban contexts will very much uh, disappear in the, in the final cities. Right, thank you. Um, before I say something about that, does anyone want to respond or add to that? Uh, yeah, um, it, it, I just noticed that uh, in the video he did not uh, mention really who did trumpet this change. So who was <coughs> behind the idea that we should change the, the city planning? Um, maybe this is building also on what Lucas has said, uh, the, the, the involvement of the people in this uh, transformation. Um, was not really that clear either in California or in, in, in China. So um, the, the, the success of the case study really depends on how people respond to it uh, and how they are on board with what's going on uh, rather than just having the buildings there uh, and nobody's using them because then we are just uh, narrowing the streets and limiting the area that they use their cars and they are not open to using uh, the BRT system or the public transport and this does not solve really the problem, it rather adds to it. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? And can I add something to that? Sure. Um, and it links back to your original question about the role of behaviour. Um, so in my PhD I'm looking at the adoption of new forms of mobility and mm -hmm. um, so particularly I'm looking at peer-to-peer -peer mobility so peer-to-peer -peer car sharing and peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing and there are proven sustainability benefits to these uh, technologies or these new innovations but people that won't use them because they're not convenient for them and it links back to something that came out of this video about the argument about autonomous vehicles like if you want to or they said like 50% uh, of people won't share them, even though they're intended, like the benefits arise from them being shared. Um, and there's a, a lot of argument that I've read in the mobility um, domain at the moment, which argues that we have to have like connected and shared mobility solutions. But if the will of the people isn't there to use these solutions, then where does that leave us? Like just with a bunch of redundant technologies that sort of, like, but people are so locked into their own like ways of, of doing things and then changing from that from their own norm is inconvenient right thank you any other thoughts i do so um sharing is in a very um interesting uh, point and services like uber and co we tend to call them part of the shared economy but if you actually look at uber and some of the facts they're actually very much shared there are so the occupancy rates of uber is 0 0.2 so one is um if um there is one person on vehicle is fully occupied throughout the whole time um, but on average if you look at vehicles of a time span or perhaps over a given period of time they have actually very low occupancy. So Uber, you know, which is often presented as shared mobility, isn't actually isn't actually shared. And um, it isn't very. So what you're raising, and I think, um, um, or if you have been raising, is the question about what assumptions are being made about lifestyles, our needs, our daily day-to-day -day practices, um, and um, about their links to urban form, um, and. Um, are these assumptions realistic? Do they apply everywhere? Um, and um, yeah, how do we need to understand really what do we need to do to understand the social world, social practices, 
um, in order to you know gauge the success of you know compact <coughs> interventions. And I think the the point at the beginning, um, which was about um, again assumptions about our um, behavior. Um, in fact, you could argue that you know what Calthorpe's vision, what he presents. Um, is informed by middle class as middle class notions of a good neighborhood. You know, it's a middle class vision of a good city. You have shared space. You have a public space. Um, you have cafes and you know different um, activities made for consumption, basically, um, of course linked to recreation and so forth. But um, you know consumption opportunities. Um, but each individual household's got his or her own or their own private spaces, private units, um, and um, and then there's public space. So this division between private and public space, which is a particular Western vision, also strongly linked to a, a middle class vision of life, and is completely different, for example, to um, other forms of um, um, living, perhaps. Um, for example, you know, as we find them in the Chinese hutongs, where there's much more shared space, um, kitchens and toilets, for example, are shared, um, and and there's a very different kind of communal life, um, which isn't um, very much predicated on that very strong distinction between private and public. Okay, so um, so that is, you know, I'm not saying the one is better than the other, but um, one should recognize that there's a particular vision. Uh, which is rooted in uh, potentially social class. Um, also, the social class planners and architects um, tend to come from, of course, um, um, also drawn from the wider environment, politicians, decisions made, decision makers, and so forth. So there is a certain specificity to those solutions uh, that may not be applicable everywhere. The other point, and I'm sorry, I'm bad at remembering names and capturing quickly as they appear on the screen. But um, the other point that was made was about the planning process itself. There were questions about the planning process in China um, as an example of a more top-down approach perhaps to planning um, than, and then in other um, um, contexts. Um, and that is absolutely crucial as well. So the question of how decisions are made. And in some sense, there's a tension here because at some point, also very clearly says, um, you know, it is about us, it's our behavior, okay? It isn't the Exxon Mobiles, et cetera, and the companies, it is us. And, um, but then, so the, and very much a focus on individual choice, but then we move towards the question of planning. And then he says at another point in, in the video, um, that um, it is planners that need to get on board. We all want the same thing, but it is planners and politicians that we need to get on board. Um, and of course, then the strong narrative around uh, the urban environment itself. And this is a very common and a very important tension in the planning literature community everywhere, even in social science, that uh, tension between the individual, the wider environment, and then power you know, who is actually taking uh, the decision and what are these decisions uh, motivated by. Um, and um, so here we, um, we need to look at the um, planning process um, as well um, and in the way decisions are made. And the, a paper um, by um, a Bar and Prilvitz that's on the reading list very much focuses on that attention and raises some important questions about this tension between the individual and the wider wider context of decision making. Um, what we find is that the planning process, um, the way it works, the planning process always has formal and informal elements, uh, at least in the global north. And you know, depending where you are, informal and formal elements and take precedence. Um, but there are formal consultation periods, of course, in, 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 in let's say Europe. I'm most familiar, of course, with the European models of the planning process, um, where there are designs, they are um, opened up for public scrutiny, um, there are examinations in public, um, and then feedback is sought by individual residents, by other interest groups, um, and then ideally they are being considered 
and usually when um, and there's certainly there's a formal procedure of recording them and then again see each of the concern normally have to document a decision why or why not has been considered and it's really about planning it's about the kind of balancing of these different demands and they come from from different areas and um, there is a formal process um, in which that needs to be documented but there's also a deliberate informal process a design process where um, people group and informal groups where people get ideas um, where they in some sense structure pre-structure the um, the design um, before it is actually um, made public so there are informal processes around it that is allowed that is necessary necessary part of the planning process um, but depending on where we are those informal processes can take precedence over the formal and the, the relation between the two uh, can be quite different and lead to different outcomes um, but in, I've got a glimpse into master planning in a German city at some point, and um, and there was notable how through informal mechanisms, a um, important car producer got a heavy influence on master planning in Munich. And of course, car producers, car makers have a particular vision of what they their city would like to be. Um, and so that is, you know, a huge, a huge influence there. The question is, what are the kind of governance and planning process, process arrangements that allow for you know, more sustainable cities? So you can feel like you see, I can say a lot about it, um, but um, yeah, just to say, very good point on participation and planning. Um, the question: How does the planning process work? And then that tension between individual choice and then top-down approaches that may be needed to realize a more sustainable uh, uh, vision. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts? Any other questions? It's just one thing. What you have said right now just made me uh, think about the type of residents that these. Uh, newly developed areas or redeveloped areas is uh, attracting. So whether they're attracting uh, the same people who used to uh, live in more sprawled areas and now they are li living in, in this medium or high density uh, living spaces, or is it attracting people from out of the city or all in all who are new uh, uh, immigrants to the city or a population that is uh, resident in, in the city um, uh, newly and then their views would be different about what the city means than uh, the original uh, dwellers, if we can say that. Just a thought that I have about this difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think another component of what you were saying is, and another idea is, cities as attractors, cities as attracting people, also in the context of tourism. I do think Coulthard says at some point, we all know what a good city is, Right. Um, and um, when we think about you know, different forms of governance, um, um, again, and how cities compete with each other and how they want to create environments um, um, that attract investment, that attract tourists itself uh, uh, as well, um, often those kind of environment, um, built environment interventions correlate with greater attraction which means greater travel for other purposes from tourists and so forth so one thing um, that you know, we often forget when we talk about cities as being part of the solution is the increase in mobility and air travel for example which um, uh, tend to um, be linked to intensive uh, intensive or intensification of activities um, in cities as well they need to travel um, to a sustain, you know, tourism um, or the needs of the industry, but also to sustain the various concentrated, clustered business activities um, that occur in a sort of global, urbanized uh, world. So that's the kind of flip side, or the other, the other um, phenomenon that accompanies it. Not right now, of course, at the moment, and who knows whether there will be permanent changes. Um, and that is going to be interesting, but up to a point increasing mobility and the need for increasing mobility uh, which very much goes hand in hand with urbanization any other thoughts <laughs>
I think what you also pointed to is uh, one of the questions uh, for the task. Um, we were supposed to think about if it's possible to uh, to implement these uh, planning principles everywhere and if yes uh, why and if not why well we were thinking about or discussing certain barriers that might be a problem for this sustainable development and we were uh, discussing that there might always be some physical barriers the city might be divided by a river, there might be a mountain, there might be a bay, and there might, for example, be an industrial area which is un unlinkable with the residential area. There are just barriers that are always going to make a sprawl. And also what we were talking about is, or are uh, the cultural, uh, barriers minorities uh, just having different um, habits behavior aspects etc or cultural barriers in meaning of what people want this is i think what you were talking about that first we have to know what people want if if there are people if there's a majority of people who want to have their own garden their own single family house this this these principles will just not work there absolutely um and what we find you know what, what it can happen is as we change our built environment and that is in fact difficult existing build structures to change build structures but if we change our typologies and manage to get everything done so those people who prefer to live in a private garden will move to a different location which potentially then increases travel distances as well so precisely those kind of unintended consequences and potential contradictions we really need to look at the whole picture and kind of look at urban form just in isolation but we need to very much look at the cultural context um, and the governance context and the planning context around it and that's absolutely crucial yeah um, very good any other thoughts perhaps in terms of technology did you have any thoughts on technology autonomous vehicles Um, yeah, like one of the uh, discussion prompts was about whether or not we agree with um, Cal Thorpe's views on mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles and personally I do agree with it um, and it links back to what I said earlier about you can have technologies but if people don't want to use them then it, it becomes redundant but also like creating more car or like having the capacity for the same amount of vehicles or more vehicles isn't going to solve a lot of the other issues that we have in cities and so there's questions about uh, land use um, which will still be there even if we have autonomous vehicles like an autonomous vehicle it might reduce emissions but it's not going to reduce congestion or like um, parking like the land use that we have in cities which is dedicated to parking and like this whole concept of car centric city planning that we have at the moment um that all those issues will still be there depending on like it doesn't it doesn't matter what type of fuel your vehicle is powered by or the technology within your vehicle like it's i think it's more of a systemic issue rather than just that like, we have to change um the way that people practice mobility rather than just change one aspect of the technology of their practice. And um, that, that's our view on this point. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Any other thoughts? I just had a thought, but it's not related to technology specifically. It's more back to, um, I think, Eva's point around barriers. Um, and I'm sorry, the neighbors cutting the lawn, so there's a bit of background noise. Um, it's the issue of safety. I think in a lot of cities, you may want to you to walk, to cycle, to use public transport, but um, it's not safe for you to walk the three blocks 
from where you get off the bus to your house at night mm -hmm. and to drive if you have the option. Um, so I think that's a kind of contextual issue that also has to be addressed if you are if you are trying to change a different or create a different way of commuting. Yeah, yeah. It's again a social, cultural, contextual factor um, that uh, needs to needs to be taken into account. Absolutely. Um, any other thoughts? So on autonomous vehicles, um, absolutely. So it is a technology again; it can't be seen out of context. Uh, we need to uh, think about it. it. Is an opportunity, um, of course, um, but we need to um, yeah, think about it very carefully. And there is another dilemma here because um, sure, we just ban them, and how does that sit with our, you know? Um, sort of more liberal uh, perhaps visions of, of society does it have to be a top-down approach or do we need to find a slightly different solution and um, one way of thinking about autonomous vehicles is actually um, to look at existing less accessible locations and allow people to reduce automobile dependence on those so when you for example have a sprawling area um, or a very typographic typographically highly complex area where it's difficult to um, put a public transport service in there. Can those autonomous vehicles perhaps reduce the dependence on car ownership, get people to the nearest transit station and use it as a feeder um, and then enable those com uh, existing areas to be a bit more sustainable, reduce travel or um, encourage people to use different modes. So thinking about this in a more integrated perspective with what already exists and the existing um, um, system, uh, perhaps that will be uh, one way of thinking about um, autonomous vehicles. And then the last point very quickly, and I think Sid is on my screen very big, which means probably we should stop. Um, and uh, using the safety um, example, perhaps as a way to wrap up as well, um, to, to say, so urban, I think we can conclude urban Compact urban form definitely has a potential to mitigate um, energy demand as it comes through travel or through different um, avenues. It opens up opportunities for shorter distances uh, um, and um, a more active travel. Um, but whether it actually happens in the real world is a completely different question. So we've got one potential here, one potential, um, one opportunity but we need to look at these other factors around it um, that might actually be in contradiction with those and that may not um, allow for the potential energy saving and energy efficiency benefits to be realized in this moment of time in this particular location. So one has to take those kind of ideas and design principles um, as a starting point but then really um, look at the particular historical and spatial context um, and to explore them and try to, um, to make them work. And here I want to come back to the planner's triangle that we looked at, which is a really useful starting point to think through urban form in relation to those other sociocultural factors and economic factors that might be in conflict you know, with um, sustainable compact urban form principles. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. And uh, I enjoyed this a lot. I hope you did so too. And yeah, good luck with the rest of the, um, enjoy the rest of the uh, summer school. <laughs>